All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, we are now about to start our operations panel. Um, this one is called Shrink Grow, the Status Quo, What's the Future of EM Operations? We have some great people here today. I'm just gonna introduce our moderator, Dr. Sam Shen, who is the Vice Chair of Operations at the Stanford uh, Emergency Department. He's a professor of emergency medicine here. Great guy. Sam, take it away. Thanks, everyone. And I'm very excited uh, to have this uh, amazing panel. Um, I wanted to first uh, introduce uh, all members, and then uh, we can get started with some questions to talk about uh, the status quo, the future uh, of uh, emergency medicine, emergency department operations. Um, first, we have uh, Dr. David Feldman. Uh, he is the head of strategic technology partnerships at Inflect Health and Vituity. Uh, he's a practicing emergency physician and a senior partner of uh, Vituity and chairman and medical director at Good Sam uh, here in our local Bay Area. Um, we also have um, uh, Dr. Christopher Sharp, Topher Sharp. He is the chief medical information officer at Stanford Healthcare, and he's a professor of medicine at the uh, Department of Medicine you know, um, at Stanford University. And then we have uh, Dr. Mark uh, Fugernick, who is the uh, medical director and emergency services chairman, also on the board of directors at VEP uh, Healthcare. Um, and so uh, thank you all for uh, joining. Um, I wanted to first uh, bring, uh, uh, describe a little commentary and then uh, uh, and get into uh, some questions, get your perspectives. Um, you know, when we think about emergency uh, medicine and EDs, um, it's actually an access point for uh, episodic and unscheduled care. And we know with COVID, you know, average volumes are down 20, 25% across the country. Uh, but even without COVID, I think it's this is a very interesting discussion to think about what EDs uh, could look like in the future from an operational and delivery of care perspective. Um, and specifically how technology could influence that. Um, you know, we typically think of the ED care model, somebody comes in, get triage, they get seen, um, diagnostics happen, and they get dis uh, disposition to either home or hospital. Uh, and the goal is to move them through very quickly. And this is a very resource intensive uh, process. Um, we've been hearing from the prior talks about the role of emergency medicine uh, in adapting to innovations and different ways of caring for patients. We've also then heard about the push from a value perspective, shifting care away from this expensive ED care. Um, and we know that uh, you know, ED visits, um, despite all that, still continue to rise, at least pre-pandemic. And so you know, intentionally, we brought uh, this group together um, and not um, everyone's a mercy physician, um, but that's great because that's we wanted the different perspectives. So I want to start off by just asking uh, each of you, um, when you look ahead and you think about uh, what EDs could or will look like in the future, um, you know, do you think they're gonna be scaling up, scaling down, um, because of access issues or um, due to uh, innovative alternative ways to access care uh, based on some of the things that we've talked about earlier uh, with telemedicine, digital health. Um, so I'd just like to start uh, that off with that open-ended question. Um, uh, Dr. Feldman, would you like to uh, start us off? Sure. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, and uh, uh, Topher and Mark also, uh, very nice to be on the panel with you. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the future and the crystal ball that I'm interested to hear my fellow panelists uh, think uh, is a very interesting question. I actually think as we, I think there's a couple conflicting or sort of balancing perspectives. I think that if you look at patients and uh, the needs of patients and patient care, you know, it's it's a mitigation, it's a risk mitigation strategy or mindset. You know, they want the best care uh, when they need it um, at their fingertips. And we've also been promised in this country sort of, you know, the best modern health care whenever we feel like we need to get it. Um, and actually there's laws written around, you know, the layman's definition of emergency and things like that. And so that's going to drive people to seek out care um, in the best way they know how. So that and pre-COVID, you know, that was being seen in person by a physician. Um, otherwise, telemedicine was not something or remote care was not something that was really as embraced. And COVID pushed us into this whole different uh, mindset, right? So instead of saying, OK, I'm going to go see my doctor and they're going to give me great care. Uh, now, if I go see my doctor in the hospital, I go to the emergency department where I work. Uh, in San Jose, you know, I could get coronavirus, which we know very little about, and I could die. So all of a sudden, volumes plummeted, people stopped coming in, and it led to other issues. And in the future, as we go forward, I think now that we've sort of cracked into remote care, digital care, people started getting used to it. I think the pendulum will start swinging back and forth. We're starting to see more people come back to the ER, although it's a slow, steady progression. And then that'll probably swing to find a new, a new sort of new normal. But I actually think as we start to expand uh, digital health, digital access points to health, remote care, I actually think that the emergency department and critical care and procedure rooms, ORs and you know, procedure rooms like cath labs, 
um, will grow actually in the hospitals. So I sort of see a future maybe if you ask me to put on sort of the futures hat, fewer hospitals, but every hospital brick and mortar will actually have a first floor that may be completely emergency type care, right? 12 hours or less episodic care, people can just come on in. But the way they enter that care won't necessarily be by just driving into the hospital. They'll get their smartphone and they'll go through a digital front door and then they'll be either directed to a different level of care or they'll be directed to a brick and mortar care or um, a unit will be dispatched out to their facility to then pick them up and bring them back, much like EMS does now. Um, and so, and then the other level of the hospital will be ICU level care and um, ORs and procedure rooms, because otherwise most of the other stuff um, can be done at home and will be done at home. It's just a matter of when. And I think what COVID did for us, it was already mentioned by several speakers, is just accelerate that time frame, right? So instead of being 10, 20 years out, now it's here now or in the next three to five years, which is what's so exciting and uh, what we saw in the last 12 months in my role with with Inflecto and Vituity, it was actually tremendous for the amount of uh, uh, innovation and conversation and companies we spoke to. I mean, that went up exponentially. It didn't actually slow our business down. It actually uh, really ex accelerated it. Very interesting. Because uh, there is definitely a thought that, you know, EDs, are you, are you the um, access point for everything for everyone? Or are you really just uh, intended to be the critical care access point and everything else should really be outside? Um, uh, Topher, uh, let's move on to you. I mean, as a uh, practicing uh, internist, uh, you obviously see patients in the outpatient setting, but you see patients that can also come to the hospital uh, to be admitted um, through various ways. Um, what What are your thoughts in terms of when you look ahead, um, how the how healthcare is changing, delivery of care is changing, how that would affect um, potentially the sizing of ED or how e, uh, emergency departments are are run from the uh, uh, status quo? Hey, thanks, Sam. Yeah, so speaking as a non-emergency uh, physician, uh, it's really a pleasure to be on the panel and to be able to join you all. Uh, I've sent Sam many a patient over the years uh, out of my primary care clinic. And also, you know, I think about this uh, from the perspective of our overall health system and, and what this means for many health systems as we start to evolve forward. Um, you know, I, I, I think of uh, the, the Yogi Berra quote about how predictions are very difficult to make, especially about the future. And uh, so I, I think about this a little bit more of like what are current state forces that are really enacting that, that would be pushing us. And, you know, one of them is uh, certainly one of them is a consumerism focus. So, you know, as we digitize more and more options of medicine, there are so many ways that consumers are going to start to engage in that process more uh more informed and in a more participatory manner so you know today uh the decision about whether or not you should go to the emergency room is a part of that overall patient experience right the, the patient experience starts all the way back in these formative moments when the patient self-assesses googles their symptoms and says is this bad enough that I need to make a choice, right? That I need to go. And, and often I think when we think about emergency medicine, we think about the most critical where there's just no choice. There's no question. I'm, I'm being picked up off the ground by an ambulance to be brought in. And, and that's, a, that, that's only one perspective, at least as I would see it around how emergency rooms really uh, provide the right level of care to a community, because there's a lot that hangs out at the other end of the spectrum where the patient is actually self-assessing and deciding, what should I do here? How should I go? And, and around that, you know, consumerism is going to happen in a number of ways. One of them, of course, is going to be driven by price conscious consumers who say, hold on, I, my friend went to the emergency department and they were either hit with a surprise bill or they were just, you know, it was just an expensive endeavor in terms of money, in terms of time or other experience. And, and they're going to look for options around that that can help them to figure out and better inform themselves about what to do next in that, in that setting. And that's going to require probably two key points, right? One is that we're going to need to have a lot of information and a lot of options that are available. And we're seeing more of those starting to appear, certainly through the course of the pandemic, as we've seen not only telehealth, but a lot of the online on-demand type of telehealth or and care type of health, telehealth just exponentially grow as, as individuals have become more sensitive to that choice, not necessarily because of their economics, but because of COVID, just as, as David just talked about. Um, the other is that, you know, we're going to look to healthcare organizations to have more of a continuum that's apparent to patients. I, I really would double down on this idea of a digital front door that helps patients to navigate to the point of care that makes most sense to them, helps them see all the different permutations along the way. So you can know as a patient and say, well, I have a problem, but this problem can be 
cared for by an online service. This problem probably can be cared for by a clinic setting. This this problem really needs necess uh, necessitates that I that I get myself into the emergency department and to be able to see and, and navigate those different points along the way, both from a clinical and patient perspective, but also a dollars perspective. You know, it's it's really important that people are informed and say like, oh, I, I understand this is going to be a lower cost care, but it may or may not make sense to me as we go forward. So I, I actually think that you know one of the things that we'll see in the future. I expect is more demand for a continuum of experience and a continuum of informed options that really help you to navigate into the right place. That doesn't mean that emergency departments won't continue to have a full spectrum of care because that's always going to be necessary. But I think we're going to see people, consumers, as well as payers pushing those consumers to start to use different parts of the emergency services in very specific ways. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then same, same question to you, Mark. Yeah. Um, so I, I love when I uh, hear other people and it kind of fits with the way I'm thinking about things because then maybe I feel like I'm on the right path. And, um, and so I just want to dovetail off a lot of those comments. First of all, thanks for having me here. Really appreciate that. Um, and, and you'll notice in some of my comments, I think very highly of emergency physicians. Um, I think we have great ingenuity and we really have um, a great ability to see the forest for the trees, especially across the entire healthcare landscape. As you all know, we live at the intersection between the outpatient world and the inpatient world, and I think have a pretty good understanding of both, and not many physicians do. Um, so I think in terms of sort of volume and future, as we've already seen during the pandemic, emergency physicians have gotten incredibly creative, opening their own clinics or starting infusion centers or going into telemedicine. Um, so there's been a time where they've started to fill these gaps with their, in a sense, you know, personal resource of time and effort and ingenuity. And I think we'll keep seeing that. Um, but as um, as Dr. Toffer mentioned, you know, patients, in a sense, vote with their feet. Um, they know where they're getting the value that they seek. And just a funny story, I had, you know, a primary care clinic near us who didn't understand why their patients were coming to the emergency room. And he wanted to put one of those flyers out front that would show people where it is. I said, I think that's probably an EMTALA thing. I don't think we could do that right in front. Um, but what you need to do is improve your service whether it's through confidence or the ability to do more stuff, for whatever reason, the patient is getting what they want from us and not from you. That's what you have to solve. It's not about advertising. And then I'm going to piggyback again. I think it's all about, in terms of both financial and outcomes, improving in our continuum of care. So we're all working in the same system. I loved what you said that experience starts way before they reach us, when they start to have symptoms in Google. And that's exactly right. And so one of the ideas that I've really latched onto is I think emergency physicians are great at leading that continuum of care, kind of determining based on a patient's symptoms and risk factors, what level of care they probably need. So I think we should be sort of the, 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 um, the tip of that spear of these care continuum systems where we can be very early contact with the patient and, and, and in a sense, Kaiser EPRP is exactly this. They, they like to have early contact with an ER doc because they're good at parsing out what needs to happen now or in an hour or in a day or next week and how to get some of that done. Where, you know, let me skip several steps. This is a patient I know from just talking to them. They just need to see a neurologist. Nobody else is going to figure this out except a neurologist. Let's stop wasting time. Let's stop wasting my time. I'm going to virtually refer them to a neurologist and just get that done. And the patient will be so happy. Um, so I feel like I talked for a long time. Hopefully I addressed the question at least a little. Well, it definitely kind of uh, um, kicks off this, uh, the concept that, you know, a lot of us have been talking about, even the prior speaker, the idea that, um, you know, in a value-based uh, mentality, um, we know ED care is expensive. And many of you have touched on the fact that um, some of the care um, could be um, uh, delivered, you know, prior to coming to the ED, um, but also in a, our view based system that we currently live in or predominantly live in, you know, how do we reconcile that um, the, the uh, misalignment of economic incentives where, you know, in a strange way, emergency medicine is one of the uh, you know, few specialty that is actively trying um, to shift care away from us <laughs> uh, to other uh, avenues. Um, uh, you know, you typically wouldn't hear uh, other services saying, um, you know, I'm trying to reduce uh, business to me, but we are actively trying to shift care away from the ED. And for someone um, in your position, 
Mark, um, where VEP runs a lot of EDs and obviously volume uh, is a uh, important uh, metric. Um, how, how would you reconcile that um, in terms of the uh, the alignment, the financial alignments? Yeah, I'll start right out of the gate with this analogy that I heard a long time ago, maybe two decades ago, kind of predicting where we were heading. And I don't think we've escaped this yet. And that's that we have one foot in the canoe of value-based and one foot in the canoe of fee-based. And how do you get upstream with one foot in two different canoes? And um, we just haven't made the real shift to value-based, which would change all of our incentives. Um, so I, I think we need to keep moving in that direction and figure out, you know, it seems to be piecemeal, how we can find a value-based system so that we are managing people in the appropriate way. I'm not trying to vo drive volume into the ER because I need it. I'm not trying to vol drive volume out of the ER because um, it's expensive. I I'm trying to drive volume exactly where it should go. And that's what will maximize value. So to the primary care, if that's right, if the specialist, if that's right, to the inpatient ward, if that's right. And again, I think we're really good at picking that for people. Maybe not perfect, but about as good as anyone. So I think we should be at the at the lead point in, in parsing where people need to go to be cost effective. And that point really resonates, I would say, with our department of emergency medicine at Stanford, where um, we are very much interested in this idea of the precision emergency medicine and specifically kind of the right care, the right place at the right time for the patients. Um, uh, David, can you uh, uh, tell us kind of from your perspective as someone who's also part of a large uh, you know, group of EDs, um, you know, uh, how do you view kind of how the financial incentives between volume and value-based care, how does that affect, you know, the things that you guys are prioritizing at your organization? Yeah, no, that's a great, um, great question, Mark. Great analogy. Uh, I, I agree with that analogy for sure. Um, in, in a lot of ways, you know, emergency physicians are sort of one foot in the ER and one foot trying to go somewhere else all the time. It seems like that we, we're attracted to the two canoe world. Um, I, I think for us, you know, in, in the short term, the volume adjustments are just what we have to do on, uh, to keep the place appropriately staffed and, and be cognizant. And that's hitting the hospitals, our hospital client partners, more than it's hitting us. And um, so we, we definitely are supportive and want to make sure that we're, you know, prepared for the patients when they come in. I think the challenge and, and actually what we're doing at Vituity, what we've challenged ourselves, um, our board challenged just uh, about three years ago, was really to start to move outside the walls of the hospital and just to sort of reiterate on that concept of uh, bringing care to the patient no matter where they are. And then that way you can start to leverage technology that's available to us. And then the last year, as I said, it just accelerated it. It didn't change the course, it just accelerated the time frame, um, so that we can start to really approach that precision medicine. And I think that in larger systems like a Stanford, you can definitely have more of a presence and a view with value-based care. But in the world of Vituity and maybe you know, Mark's world VP is very similar in the sense that it is much more fee-for-service. And you know, um, we're not there's conflicting um, incentives, right? Because we know globally we want to do the best care for patients and we want to be responsible uh, to society for costs, but you're presented with an initial patient and then doing what's right for that patient in that, in that setting uh, doesn't necessarily lead itself to the best uh, value-based care approach. So that's, that's the, that's the um, conflict I agree with Mark, but I think really the technology that we're seeing becoming more and more available um, to deliver precision care, I think is a, is a path to lead us more toward, um, if not to ever leave uh, you know, the balance of fee-for-service and value-based care, but maybe, maybe to then sort of the technology will allow us to actually keep two feet in the canoe, to use Dylan Mark's analogy, but then actually uh, allow the two canoes to kind of go in the same direction. Great. And Topher, I mean, if you put on your hospital hat, um, you know, as the chief medical information officer, um, you know, representing the hospital's perspective, um, you know, how do, how, how do you view you know, the role of uh, EDs in the future uh, from a value uh, perspective, because, you know, on one hand, half the emissions come through the hospital, which is, you know, great. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want all emissions, especially re-emissions come through the hospital. Um, we don't have a huge at-risk population uh, that's capitated, but if we're moving towards that. So, you know, how do you reconcile all those different forces uh, over the next, you know, uh, five, 10 years? Yeah, it's a, it, it's a great area of challenge uh, as, as Mark and, and David are talking about, the transition between the current state and that assumed future state where we're going to get to a much more value-based and risk model. And, and I have to say assumed because I think none of us know exactly when that shift comes because there's 
so many factors that that are influencing that. But that 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 transition state becomes a question of not which canoe do you put your weight into, but how do you hedge across both in a way that is mutually satisfying? So I, I would say that our, our health system looks very carefully at the numbers of patients that are arriving into our emergency department and our volumes. And we know that those volumes translate directly into the volumes that are in the hospital. And we know that you know a hospital with empty beds isn't a hospital for very long. So of course those things are tremendously important, but that doesn't mean that we want to see people coming in and being in our beds you know, and, and, and being uh, in our hospital. Um, you know, I, I had an interesting conversation with our CEO where he, uh, he said, you know, a number of years ago, I used to stand up in front of other CEOs, and the first thing I would do is I would tell them how many beds we have in our hospital. That was our definition of value. That was the definition of where we made our profits in order to be able to support our organization and our mission. So that was always the first number out of my mouth. He said, now I look around and I realize, actually, we make our mission in our ambulatory setting foremost. That's actually more of where we generate our revenues and engage our community than our hospital. Not that our hospital isn't a big piece of what we do. Um, and he said, so now when I stand up in front of that same group, I talk about our ambulatory mission and what we're doing to fulfill that. And he said, but you know, the question that always plagues me is like, what would be the digital equivalent? What would it be to say, we care that for this many lives, have this many interactions, provide this much value? in a way where we didn't even physically touch you. And that's the question I think of like where, where this goes next. And that's the hedge that is both potentially profitable in a fee-for-service system or in a risk-based system. It's the way that you steer the right patient into the right service and that you cost control. And it's the way that you really provide the right value out to those who want to need it as we go forward. So I, I would just say, I really appreciate, Mark, your comment where you know emergency medicine really, that, that capacity to understand and triage and find the right care, connect the right parts of the health system very, very quickly in the right way that provide that right continuum to patients. You know, if we can figure out how to do that same thing digitally that you all do right now in the waiting room so incredibly effectively, or, you know, at, at, at the point of triage, that seems to me like a very secret sauce that is the opportunity for emergency medicine operations of the future. Thanks for saying that. That's exactly where we're headed is, is building sort of that telemedicine interaction. We're starting with high risk patients um, let's say post-discharge patients or other multiple comorbidities or those who've been assigned into some of these high-risk pools and having, you know, an emergency physician available to them 24-7 to, to sort of monitor and direct rather than them, as soon as they're feeling a little out of breath, you know, I better go to the ER. That's where I always get fixed up. Well, let me talk to the ER doc online and see what I really do or don't need to do right now. Um, I'll make a couple of other quick comments, um, although it looks like Sam's back. I was trying to cover um, about how to how to work in this double uh, world that we're living in. And I think there's really either two options. One is find innovations and new programs that will work for both. Um, so they work in your fee-for-service world, and there's tons of those that we could talk about, those AI-guided um, processes in your ED that just make it more efficient. doesn't matter if you're fee-for-service or value-based, you're going to save on expenses. Or the other, I think, is you get yourself into risk-based contracts one way or another, just start moving into the future, building the future. Um, maybe it starts small, but, but start carving it out and getting yourself into risk base so that you're ahead of the game in it and you're innovating. And um, I think that puts you in a more competitive spot in the future. That's a great segue into, uh, you know, the uh, next uh, uh, question I have for this group is, you know, what are some of those uh, technologies that you feel will influence and truly influence you know, how a patient's cared for from the front door to the back, um, you know, when you think about um, all the different uh, types of innovations that have been discussed so far, whether it's, um, you know, AI, whether it's, uh, you know, hardware, software, um, what are the uh, technologies that you uh, are seeing or maybe hope to see um, that will uh, truly impact um, the care delivery such that perhaps EDs don't need to be as big as they are now? Um, David, you want to start? Uh, sure. Yeah, no. Um, 
So I think that the technologies we're looking for, so at Inflect, we're, we're, we're pretty actively reaching out to startup companies. And we talked to probably, oh, I don't know, three, 400 companies a year now. We're on that pace of just looking at all the different facets that allow us to look outside the walls of the hospital. And so we start care there and all the different components that facilitate bringing the care to the patient and then directing them into the hospital and then post-hospital. Uh, so you just have that continuity of care, that sort of a uh, acute care continuum we're extending out. Uh, which is sort of the you know value prop that we we uh, our parent organization by 2D uh, really uh, pushes. I think the digital front door we mentioned. I think AR and VR are definitely very interesting technologies. But I really think it's about it's fundamentally what uh, Topher was commenting on. It's about pushing uh, the information you need, the, the the critically actionable information about patient the patient's data, as front. As, as far forward into the patient encounter, patient experience as possible. So that starts through a digital platform and then it brings in information into the emergency departments, right? It's like the first time I tried one of those electronic stethoscopes and it was like, oh my God, I heard so much stuff. I didn't even know what to do with all that data. So it's like drinking from the fire hose, but actually taking um, the right data so that you can answer the question that's in front of you with that given patient, make it actionable as early as possible in the process. So looking from it, with that lens, what we're doing is we're trying to dissect out all the different components so that we can uh, meet the needs of the patient, uh, whether it's you know at the home or if they have to come to the hospital, then bring them into the emergency department quickly. Mark, I know you have a, a strong interest in uh, AI, um, you know, in your in your work. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about where you see the role of AI in uh, ED operations? You know, what's interesting is I feel like um, like David just sort of gave a nice description of the way I see it without ever mentioning it, which is that, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning isn't really intelligent. What it is able to do is to process a lot of data very quickly and kind of offer that up to the human being to work with. And so, you know, one of the companies that we're invested in just started with a very simple triage tool trying to look at all the information that's coming in a triage and doing a better job of parsing them into, you know, levels one, two, three, four, five. And what they found is, and, and, and the program would run and it would just alert the nurse, Hey, you mark this a three, but I think they're really a two and the nurse could change them to a two or do whatever they wanted with them. And because the ER has, you know, four or fives going to a low acuity place and ones and twos getting seen right away and threes going to the waiting room, the, the results were astounding just by implementing this artificial intelligence tool that the nurses triage, patients who ended up in the ICU spent an hour less in the ED on average. They got to the ICU an hour faster. So sick patients did better. And the throughput time for the fours and fives as a group was lower because they were selected appropriately. None of them waited as a three in the waiting room. So just getting a little bit of more accurate information, having a machine do that processing for you up front quickly, absolutely changed the efficiency of the department, which it saves money no matter what model you're in. Great. Um, you know, Tofa, I'd like you to uh, perhaps uh, also uh, kind of comment on, uh, because in your role, I'm sure you see a lot of uh, companies or ideas um, that get pitched to you um, for Stanford to try. Um, what, what do you see kind of the role of uh, AI or other uh, technologies that um, can directly uh, influence, you know, how care is delivered. Well, I'll be a little heretical and say that I, I think that a lot of the advanced technologies that get pitched to me are really, really hard to integrate because we don't have foundational technologies that they can sit upon. Uh, and and that's uh, and and I don't think it's unique to Stanford. I, I think that we're pretty far ahead of the game in terms of the foundational technologies and the infrastructure that we've laid. But I you know I see a lot of of really cool stuff that there's no way that either it technically integrates into our into our system or from an experience that it integrates into our system. And and so I think that um, we also as much as we think about the the cool future stuff and and we've got cool future stuff happening. Um, you know, there are pieces we can do within our own, um, our own, our own house where we've got a lot more control and we can bring in and kind of experiment and play with, uh, you know, where AI fits and how it actually affects our operations or our clinical decisions and our efficiencies. Uh, and, and those are really important and really useful. Um, I guess going back to our prior conversation though, I think those will be, um, 
always important, but a little bit at the margin if you're really thinking about changing your interaction model. And there you have to start to lay some of the more foundational pipes to be able to open out into other areas that you wouldn't before. You know, uh, simple things like just publishing your wait times out to patients where they can find them is revolutionary and has much more, you know, may have much more impact than whether you use AI to figure out exactly what is the very most precise wait time uh, at that at that given moment. And so I think that there's a lot of fundamental pieces here. I think about things like having on-demand capabilities and the digital front door capabilities that allow patients to understand how to access those services and access those knowledge. And then those start to lay the highways where you can start to put in the cooler technologies on top and you can start to put in the the bots and the AI and the other directive technologies and predictive technologies that start to happen in those. So I, I just say that I think there's still a fair amount of fundamental uh, interactive technologies. And the other one that I kind of throw out there is that, you know, a lot of technologies maybe begrudgingly are becoming more interoperable. Uh, and that's really important because we all need to keep pushing vendors and others to be able to make these solutions that we can actually pull and parse and piece together quickly and easily. A lot of the solutions that are that are pitched are kind of all in one solutions and say, well, if you just come to my app or my website, then you know get your patient to my app, and from there it's going to be awesome. But you know we struggle to get our patients just to our own apps or to our own websites and have to kind of take that into consideration as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, over. And thank you all. I, at this point, um, I'll turn it over to you, Dan, uh, to uh, field some uh, questions from the audience. Sorry. I think we have time for probably one question here that kind of voted up the highest, um, which is really around <clears throat> this question that came earlier around EM having a target on its back, um, both from startups and from value based care. And I'd love to hear how this group kind of really thinks about how EM physicians and APPs and the whole entire staffing model that exists in the future. Um, I'll bring in this other question here that talked about a recent EM report that said that we'll have a large surplus of EM docs by 2030. And where we are going as a community, even if the, the operation side is delivering the best care to the right patient. I'll jump in and I'll start, I mean, I'll go right back to where I started. I think emergency physicians are um, really in, uh, ingenious people, really understand the entire system, have skills that translate to lots of different levels of care, and, um, and have always had this mission to serve the patient's needs. Now, I agree, if you see yourself as an emergency physician and as a resuscitationist, and I can remember, you know, decades ago that some people came out of residency feeling that way. That's what I do. I'm a resuscitationist and everything else is sort of after me or not necessary. Um, yeah, I think you're going to have a hard time carving out your new career as we get better at this. Um, Kaiser doesn't have a ton of intubations in their ERs for a reason. Their patients are well cared for in a more longitudinal way. Um, it's not that it never happened. So I think we have to kind of be willing to redefine ourselves. What do, what do we want? And I think that there are patient needs out there to fill and we'll figure out how to fill them. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll uh, echo Mark what just said. I think that there's no group of uh, physicians or even personalities that are quite as adaptable and uh, willing to push themselves outside of uh, our comfort zone so that we can adapt to the trends that are coming. Look. I think that there's, you know, the in the last week, you know, the surveys came out. There's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of angst. You know, if I was a resident coming out, I'd be concerned about what does my future look like. It'll have an impact, and we'll have to look at the workforce and workforce studies and better understand it. But at the end of the day, there's a huge patient need, care need. The technology that we have at our fingertips now that we can take powerful AI, pair it with physicians, that has the best outcomes. When you have the physician with the AI, as Dr. Zane mentioned this morning, it's better outcomes in their studies about that, right? In radiology and other areas. The AI alone is not sufficient, but the physician with the AI is better than the physician alone. And so we'll figure out ways that we can actually continue to impact our patients, our communities in a positive way, add value. And then as far as you know, your future as an emergency medicine resident now coming out, your future is very bright. You'll make a great living. You'll be able to provide for your family. So I think that the technology is, is incredibly empowering. 
And um, it's just going to be what we make for it. And I think the impact we're going to make as a group of emergency physicians and the emergency physician culture and the advanced providers uh, is going to be even more profound. And it's actually going to be a lot of fun to be a part of creating that future. Great. Maybe I'll ask one quick last adversational, adversational question as well, maybe between Topher and our two other colleagues. So Topher, at Stanford, we are an entirely vertically integrated um, emergency medicine the whole way through. And uh, our colleagues here uh, tend to be sort of, they run systems that are outsourced from a hospital. I'd love to hear what you guys thinking is around sort of this idea of a learning healthcare system in the future where all the knowledge comes into one place versus outsourcing parts of that hospital and how that dynamic might play in the future in your guys' thoughts. Hey, maybe I can jump in for a second here, Dan. Thanks, that, that's a nice controversial one. Uh, I'll just pick up on the last, last comment and say that actually everybody's got a target on their back right now. Uh, startups and Amazon want to eat my lunch as primary care as well, right? And so uh, I got to tell you, it's a, it's a cool time to be in healthcare. It's a really interesting time to be in healthcare uh, regardless. And I think, you know, this idea of vertical integration and horizontal partnerships, that's critical because the concept that a learning health system can only happen within your four walls if your walls are situated on a university campus, that has to go. Right, that that is not the future. That's not the future of a learning health system. So we've got to find ways that we actually share data, share information, and share insights. And in fact, use some of the you know capitalist economy to help us get there. Right, make this make this stuff a value statement uh, so that it's actually shared out. So from from my perspective, you know, even in the hallowed halls of an academic institution where we vert vertically integrate and insulate the walls, I'm convinced, you know, from from the outside sometimes that. That's not actually the way of the future, and, and the partnerships uh, that we all need to forge are going to be going to be critical. Mark, David, do you have any last thoughts around that? Um, yeah, I'll jump in real quick, Mark. Unless you want to go ahead. Um, well, I think I think the idea of of having this really intelligent integrated system across academic and community hospital is really pretty exciting, and then how you can expand that outside the brick and mortars of just the hospitals themselves into the community and then into the home. Um, because, you know, you, you can create a great tool that works great at my emergency department or Sam's or Mark's. Um, and then you've done a great tool for one place because it, every iteration, every every uh, facility, every community, it's just so different. But it's really finding that uh, those technologies that are truly uh, able to adapt and quickly uh, move and then iterate at different facilities. Um, but every time they go into a new new care facility, then adapt and change and be effective in, in that specific uh, facility. So I think that's where, you know, we can learn from the academic centers and start to expand and partner um, to really break those, break those things down. Great. Sam, I don't know if you have any final words before we go. No, I just, uh, thank you. I mean, it is an uh, excellent conversation. And um, I love that a lot of you guys are thinking kind of very similar in terms of what the future could look like, um, even though, you know, uh, not all of us are looking at from just purely the emergency medicine lens. Um, and again, I just appreciate all of you taking time to join us today.